Thanks, Atul. Thanks uh, for a very interesting point of view on winning together with the Nixon partnerships. And I think so is the right timing to talk about uh, this interesting topic. And first of all, I would like to thank my attendees and a, 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 a great welcome to my panelists to be part of this uh, interesting discussion where we want to talk about uh, winning together with the next in partnership. And I will let each one of them do a quick introduction for our lovely audience so they are well aware of whom we are going to hear interesting thoughts to, from. Yeah, so I'll go first. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you all are. Uh, my name is Dhruv Kohli. Uh, I'm a part of HCL Tech uh, at the central office in Noida. We call it a corporate office. Uh, been with the company for about 14 years now, uh, really trying to impact uh, the, the space where we call it as our ecosystem strategy. And so well goes with the topic that we have today in the discussion. So really great to have the uh, you know this discussion and with the lovely panelists we have. Hello, everyone. My name is Therese Johnson, and uh, very excited to be here for this topic. Uh, my world uh, started uh, as a longtime consultant. I was a partner for a long time uh, to uh, a lot of the Microsoft products, and then ultimately spent almost a decade at Microsoft, uh, working across uh, many GSIs, a huge global network, and uh, and then I uh, went over to Salesforce. And so we'll talk more. I'll integrate that, some of that in the conversation uh, between those roles. Uh, but my world has been all about sitting at the edge of innovation. So when you think about today's world, I mean, at, at, at Microsoft, we were uh, blockchain uh, a decade ago. Uh, and, uh, and so when you think about the world of mixed reality, um, uh, extended reality, uh, AI, and uh, all of the big tech um, uh, around IoT, that really is the world that I sat in and worked with a lot of partners on that side. So again, it's really exciting uh, as I'm transitioning out of Salesforce and moving to a whole world of so many different startups that I've supported in the past. This is just a great year for disruption and partnerships. And I look forward to talking more about that. All right, the next. next one. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Michelle Graf. I'm with security. I uh, manage our global uh, partner alliances and channel. Um, mm -hmm. My role here is to build uh, an ecosystem that helps align to where our customers are on the journey and close that gap um, for accelerating and unlocking value to our customers through our, our partners. Um, my past, um, I'm sort of a startup junkie. I have built uh, many ecosystems from start the start. Um, some might say I, I asked for a lot of pain, but uh, I was very early on at Palo Alto Networks, I think employee 100 employee 40 at Pure Storage, and then um, about employee 300 at HashiCorp. So I've had three really good runs, um, taking them from zero to through IPO, and uh, now at security, uh, just over 400 folks uh, looking to do the same thing and build that um, nonlinear growth, if you will, uh, by leveraging um, the skill sets across multiple different routes to markets and partners. So today, hopefully we can explore a few of those and, uh, and learning from the rest of the great panel here. All right, um, awkward silence, but uh, hey, uh, my name is Harish Ayer. Uh, I work uh, as a area vice president here at ServiceNow. Um, background, uh, interestingly, I started my career selling ice creams um, uh, in a small company called Unilever uh, back in India. And then uh, through a series of uh, planned and unplanned moves, ended up at Apple uh, as their marketing manager for South, uh, South Asia and um, and then joined Microsoft back mm -hmm. in 2000. So I spent two decades at Microsoft and uh, about a year back, this amazing opportunity as it now uh, beckoned me and then I'm, here I am. Uh, I manage a segment of our global partnerships uh, uh, along with a team of mine. Um, and so really look forward to learn a, a lot from this panel. That's that's. That's the most um, interesting part for me for this discussion. And then also bring some of the insights, uh, not specifically around technology uh, pieces, but really around the trends that I've come to, uh, to observe over the last many years, having worked in this channel and specifically um, ar around the globe. So look forward and thank you for joining us today. Hi, my name is Marianne Reuling. I am uh, working with our global system integrators at Microsoft. 
been 18 years with Microsoft, um, come originally out of the telco uh, world. And previous to this particular role that I do now for about two years, I, uh, I was working in Europe. I am from the Netherlands and uh, was responsible for Central and Eastern Europe for all of our partner ecosystem. So I have a very broad experience in working from every type of partner that Atul laid out in his presentation in terms of different partnership models. So uh, pretty broad experience. Great. I am strongly agree with all of you that I'm super excited to be part of this uh, panel discussion. And a quick introduction about myself. I represent Zenov. I work in the capacity of partner with Zenov based out of Seattle and work very closely with the technology companies. But now getting into the discussion, the heated discussion, I'll start with Harish. You mentioned that long time back, it was more of uh, selling the ice creams in Unilever, but now it's a technology world. And I'm sure that you will agree that the partner evolution took place. What it was 10 years back, I think, so if you look at the subject line, it was just winning with the partners. But the today's subject line is winning together with next-gen partnerships. So how it has evolved. And the, the, the partners are known for very specific services. But now, every, today, everyone is everybody. Like So happy to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, I think, uh, yes, there is a fundamental shift in cross-pollination across uh, partner types, traditional partners types such as SIs, MSPs, WARs, DISTs, et cetera. Historically, uh, these were based on their primary business models, but that has changed. And this change is driven by our customers and their steady push for transformation. Um, an interesting data point, and th this doesn't come from Zeno, I apologize, but uh, B2B digital transactions topped $10 trillion a couple of years back through COVID, and it's growing at 10% plus according to Digital Commerce 360. So just consider a few factors that, are, that our customers are driving. As most of us know, the customer demand has, has shifted from buying products to buying solutions. And and more to buying business outcomes. That's what they, they need. What this meant is, is the evolution uh, of the channel as well from defined products to more configurable solutions and, and to SaaS. Particularly SaaS has reduced the need for linear supply chain functions, uh, typically provided in a, in a two-tier distribution model where distribute a partner uh, and then the customer. So that's one trend. Uh, or one one factor. The second factor is the technology conver uh, convergence. Uh, today, almost all new content, all new applications, everything is digital. And for partners, the fundamental currency has shifted to IP and differentiation. Uh, so that's the second second trend, the second factor. The third is the the buyer dynamics. So the buyer pro persona has changed because of all of these business outcome driven technology decisions, the decision maker has shifted from CIO, CFO, in many cases to line of business owners or, or business decision makers. Uh, now for, for partners, what that has meant is specialization is getting more granular and more specific uh, to industry verticals, to horizontals and uh, uh, to th things like security and, uh, and other specific areas. So, so technology vendors are looking for their partner channel to get more and more specialized. Um, and, and lastly, in, in some cases, the customers, look they look to buy directly from their principal software vendors, especially for large transactions. They want better skin in the game, better concessions from these technology vendors. As a result, um, this concept of resell um, in these large transactions, um, the, the technology vendors don't see too much of value in that because of there are there are concerns, concerns around cost of sale and value that these resellers bring or the resell notion brings. So what does it all mean? Uh, the partners have had to evolve to monetize these shifting trends. The legacy view of partner types such as DISTs or Systems integration, integrators, value adders, value added resellers, hostess, et cetera, has rapidly evolved into two broad overlapping categories uh, services and IP. Um, in, in fact, uh, you know, if I may trademark this, we, we are evolving into a world of where everyone, everyone is everybody. In fact, uh, IDC projects that in, in the next five years, 
80% of our partners will do all activities. Uh, so whether it's a traditional SIs who have traditionally focused on delivering project services or bespoke app dev, uh, or adding managed services, agile CI, CD capabilities to serve customer needs, not just to get to the cloud, but help them stay there, optimize and innovate. Traditional distributors are adding capabilities uh, to deliver technical services and digital, digitally transforming their own cloud marketplaces by either buying or establishing their own cloud marketplaces with integration with other marketplaces. So partners are either going upstream or downstream looking for customer value, revenue, and profitability. My observation um, uh, is that I expect services partners, and I'm using services partners and not uh, not an SI by uh, on purpose that I expect services partners to generate 50% or more of their revenue and profitability from managed services and IP. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to establish a different uh, continuous customer engagement model, differentiation, create revenue predictability and, and, and higher margins. So what does that mean to principal software vendors like uh, ServiceNow or Microsoft or hardware vendors is that they would need to evolve their own partner segmentation uh, and they need to evolve their um, their engagement models, even, even their own internal organization and compensation model to adapt to this revolution. So taking that point, Harish, uh, I think so that's a very interesting point and the partners are going very granular and Michelle will come to you. That Taking that point and we've seen that the nature of the partnerships is continuously changing the multifold. Like the partners are more outcome driven, would like to co-innovate and co-develop with customers. What according to you are the key benefits for the partners in this evolved set of the partnership constructs? Yeah, th thank you. Um, and so I, I would you know, reiterate, reiterate some of what Harish said around um, moving towards specialization, but I think I'd even take it one step further where it's specialization to drive towards unification, right? And so what I mean by unification is unifying um, and, and orchestrating multiple technologies together. And so my goal, you know, in building out the new ecosystem is to build a program and build investments and solutions for partners where they're incented, um, they're enabled, and, um, and, and they're capable of being able to bring together multiple ISVs with their existing technology and with the cloud partners all together. And so with that, I think there's you know, maybe a little bit of a shift, right, in how we um, help partners realize greater benefits from their customers. And so, you know, if you think about product-led growth, we're no longer reliant just on partners to introduce us to companies. I think many companies are doing a lot of self-education, a lot of self-awareness, uh, but it is now the partner's opportunity to be that orchestration layer between the ISV, the CSP, and the customer. Um, and helping those customers really unlock value from their existing technology. And if they do that, and if they're taking new technologies and orchestrating new technologies together and helping them accelerate key business initiatives like digital transformation or cloud transformation, they'll be able to unlock those new pathways that Harish you know, talked about earlier, new pathways on bundled solutions on marketplaces. And I don't just mean cloud marketplaces, but ISV marketplaces, distribution marketplaces, um, and they'll be able to sell more of their solutions through those marketplaces um, by being that orchestration layer um, and unifying technology together. And then secondly, I think they become um, much greater value to an organization and to an enterprise with the lack of you know, technology staff, with the lack of developers, they become the sticky layer and they're almost integrating themselves and their services and solutions into an organization because they've built that customization and they've unified multiple technologies together to drive those business outcomes. And so I think that you know really you know gets partners into not just technology deployment, but building uh, uh, day two and day three services for driving adoption and building adoption of technology at scale within those organizations. And let's let's be real, you know, a company doesn't buy technology, you know, to have it be shelfware or to turn it on in one use case. Um, even now more than ever, 
you know, companies need to be able to realize and unlock the value of their technology investments. And so that needs to be adopted across the company. And I think partners are the only ones that can do that. Vendors are not set up to deliver those types of services, and they don't have the capabilities to understand those other technologies. And so, you know, in short, you know, to that question, I think the benefit is that the partner becomes that orchestration layer um, and they're unifying multiple technologies together uh, to drive greater uh, customer outcomes. Great. Uh, unlocking the value from these partners and we'll come to Marion. Uh, as you mentioned that she's responsible for managing the global system integrators. But Marion, you will agree with us and I think so with everyone in the ecosystem, there's a, there's a strategic focus on new age channels. Uh, like going beyond what the, the current partner ecosystem model looks like. As for you, what are these and how it is enabling the business growth and innovation? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Rajat. And I mean, Microsoft is about 40 years old. And, and I just want to do a quick flyby because the reality is, is that if we did not have our initial partnership, we as a company wouldn't have existed. Yeah, it was building the OS for IBM that got us started. And even today, more than 95% of the revenue of Microsoft gets generated or gets touched by a partner. Yeah, and so if the partners are not successful, Microsoft is not successful. That's how it's literally built into the DNA. And so what it meant, if you look at the evolution, we, we started with OEM device partners and SMB resellers which is pretty much all about what is the commercials for the partners and what are the programs. And then when Microsoft started in enterprise, we built the, the enterprise part, the ecosystem, which is all about co-building solutions, about co-selling and co-delivery. What is interesting, when the cloud came, we started to have a whole different way of working and looking at ISVs. And there was two elements. One is product development, what is the product an ISV is building and, and, and how is cloud incorporated in that product, but also digital commerce and the whole marketplace. So how do you create kind of the digital engines, whether that's selling, whether that's delivering inside of the clouds and integrating that deeply. Now, when it comes to some real new stuff that we're working on is Microsoft is now thinking of, how can cloud be deeply embedded into industry? And there's some three examples that I would like to give you. The first one is our partnership with Cruise. Cruise is a, a company that is invested by General Motors, Honda. Mm. And what Cruise wants to do, it wants to create transportation capabilities, which is zero emissions, shared driving, zero crashes. So it's all about autonomous driving, shared driving, and, and, and solving for congestion. And their thought about that in the industry, and think of it, you know, a car for Microsoft is like a massive computer. I mean, the compute power that goes on in a car, the software that sits in a car is just out of this world. And so having their vision then, and then us becoming their technology partner, their exclusive partner, learning from them on their deep industry knowledge, building then our cloud technologies for that industry specifically, and then give that to the broader transportation industry was one of the partnerships. And we took a billion dollars of investment into Cruise to really cement that. And so that one example. The second example we now have in December is with London Stock Exchange. And there are two aspects here. One is, of course, how do you take data that comes out of trading, execution? How do you build the analytics? How do you create a workplace environment? Not only do that for London Stock Exchange themselves, but London Stock Exchange also, through Refinitiv, serves 40,000 financial institutions in 190 countries. So what we did also there, we took a 4% equity stake we're working with London Stock Exchange to understand deeply how to transform financial services and then work that out as a whole new industry play. And then the final example, Rajat, that of course, you know, lots of excitement about me, is the exclusive partnership with OpenAI. And we, we did an investment in 2019, we did a further investment in 2021. The two companies came together 
because OpenAI had really very strong thought leadership and capabilities on generative AI, but needed a cloud partner. And what we did as a cloud partner, we built super computing capability. We redesigned hardware, we redesigned software, we built different architecture. And by going that deeply into the integration, not only have we created breakthrough, I mean, OpenAI has built great breakthrough technology now in terms of what, what these AI models can do. It gives us then now the ability, whether that's on, on Azure OpenAI to provide that AI as a platform service, but also all of that tech is going into Microsoft's products, whether that is in office, whether how we do coding, how we do CRM capabilities, how we do contact center, how we do dynamics. I mean, how we do power platform. It's 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 coming out now at a massive speed. It's coming so fast. You know, I'm still learning every day about new capabilities. But that is the type of new age partnerships where you can unlock whole new industries. And that, that innovation is very exciting. Great. I think so the three type of partnerships are a great one. But Trees, if we come to you, uh, Marion spoke about uh, these strategic partnerships on the, with the enterprise, both of the enterprise and the, the strategic partnership with OpenAI. But this is your experience. Are the, the overall the partners ready for the the next set of the disruptions, or I should say the opportunities. And what will be the next form of investments or the innovations that can be introduced by the partner ecosystem or can be supported by the large SaaS players? What is your viewpoint on that? Yeah, I, I, and I'm with everyone actually all speaking to some of the same things, right? The convergence of capabilities, the convergence of technology, and even the convergence of processes inside of really big, bold use cases that exist today and some that don't exist now, but need to exist because the convergence has led us uh, to different behaviors and patterns and the way that customers see their own world. Uh, and as you stated that it's birth a new way to think of partner ecosystems. I've been coaching really a lot of different, whether it's the SMB businesses uh, world, uh, as well as now the startup ecosystem, because they're now having to build partner ecosystems from day one. Uh, they're coming in with just incredible technology. There's one that I work with that's all around blockchain and AI. And they built an industry platform uh, that crosses actually two bespoke industries, like oil and gas, uh, and then the federal world. And so what's happened is now they're a key part of this convergence technology and convergence capability and have to be able to go end to end with oil and gas processes, right? Subsea all the way to uh, onshore. And that's not what they're equipped to do from a functional perspective. So then what happens is, you know, you, you reach out to coaches uh, that can come in and start to reinvent the world of what we think about generative partnerships, uh, which is a route that people can, you know, partners can take in order to say, okay, great, we're going to bring a new market offering, a customer offering. It is going to be bespoke to customer outcomes. And so then you come together in a partnership and that part of the ecosystem is just one way to be able to approach the business. Well, the same company understood that in order for them to be able to go end to end, generative partnerships could only complete one part. But there's also a part of the ecosystem that they needed to drive a decarbonization transformation. Uh, net zero offerings or um, you know, energy efficiency offerings is not their core driver. They have the infrastructure, this blockchain enabled capability that's super um, packed with deep learning and a lot of really cool capabilities, but it's not totally functional. So then we had to coach and bring in through journey mapping um, to understand all the offerings that another company offered, uh, and they were more functional across decarbonization and net zero offerings, but it was all functional. They had no product. Um, and then a final partner. So then that partnership uh, was going to be more of a co-innovation partnership. Co-innovation allows everyone to maintain and own their own IP. And then we're moving forward with innovation, innovation service offerings where we're not connecting the product. Well, then finally, we needed another addition to the product, right? So the company needed to bring in 
a partner that they could co-create with. Uh, the partner has low bandwidth technology that empowers offshore subsea with sensor technology. A lot of the IoT, they have a whole platform that's dedicated uh, to deep sea management. So guess what happens? You talk about partner innovation and doing something new and different and bringing it to market. We had to get all of these partners, uh, ISV, um, SI, uh, and then uh, the functional services partner in one room. And what we did was really unique. We sat down and started again, looking at not only the offer in the market, we had a researcher that did literally took all three companies, the four companies, I'm sorry, that was in the room. And they went off for one week and did deep research on a couple of things on the markets, that we were actually going to approach within the oil and gas space. They did deep research on each of the portfolio offerings. And by the time they came back and deep research on customer, their behaviors and their habits, we had a huge portfolio leading this human led design uh, thinking session. And every partner, not it's not just about listing your capabilities, right? We're beyond that. That's when we used to you know, not be in a consumptive world where uh, everything is about consumption. And then the more that, uh, as Marianne kind of stated about the adoption, that's what's missing is now they have all of these investments. They have legacy investments that they could never get rid of. You think of oil and gas in the world of SCADA, think of them in the world of, of lots of legacy uh, back-end systems, their ERPs and, and all of the other things that make their asset management systems, those will stay. But then they have to introduce new emerging technologies uh, they're experiencing right now with open technologies, generative AI, as someone mentioned earlier, um, and open AI. How do they bring all of these things together for end-to-end -end innovation experiences? So this one company now has a multi-dimensional partner ecosystem, and they're able to drive all of this in such a unique way like never before because they're starting backwards with all of the research. It's very rigorous, very intensive. They have multi-dimensional partnership models just for one customer. And they're getting ready to land an incredible contract now. That's huge. It's one of their first big seven-figure contracts for a company of this size. So we are seeing disruptive ways. Is everyone prepared that answer probably is no, because look at what I talked about, that it takes an order to meet the market where they are, where customers have to continuously disrupt themselves. Sure. But sure. we feel like that new frameworks are going to be birthed because it's a forcing function. The traditional way of partnering does not work in the new in the new wave and the new ecosystems. So I know we're going to continue more conversations around this, but again, the co-innovation, co-creation, generative partnerships, along with strategic partnerships, all of these allow uh, each of the different partners to maintain their own IP and come together in a way that doesn't burden the risk of the way sure. we used to partner, right? So thank you. Great. I think so. The way you define the playbook, including the co-create, co-innovation, I'll take that and come to Dhruv. And Dhruv comes from the SI, I should say the GSS side. Uh, he would be very interested in all the opportunities that he sees by all the panelist members. But Dhruv, coming to you, like, do you see a difference in the business growth and taking the point from trees that she mentioned, the co-create, co-innovation? But do you see a difference in business growth when partners think to create a dedicated business unit aligned to a technology or the industry or the workloads and what are the best practices? Sure, I think after hearing, uh, you know, co-panelists, uh, I think uh, there's definitely an overlap in each one of those uh, words being said by individual panelists. But uh, coming from a point of view, how I see from a global system integrators uh, lens, right? I think the uh, first part of your uh, question, you would have seen this space, you know, it's it's extremely, extremely buzzing at this moment, you know, not just global system integrators, even the regional ones or the smaller mid-tier ones as well, you know, announcing the ecosystem strategy uh, pretty clearly now. We've had examples, uh, you know, where it is evident that, you know, there is no partner strategy without having a accurate and more, more, uh, widely laid out an ecosystem strategy with a partner. Now, this could be with a hyperscaler, large partner, or this could be with a technology you know, area as a domain. But 
if you ask me very straight on this question absolutely yes we see a big difference in the growth uh, the way it is projected if we move in the more ecosystem led modern look at it like this that you know uh, the it players the isvs right their routes to markets today are extremely extremely diversified right customers uh, are looking at a global system integrators to be closer to their digital journey and make an impact with them with more outcome based model so that we have the skin in the game with the customer and walking the path now another expectation those large contracts or those customers have from us is to bring this whole flurry of different competencies available in the market through a single channel and that single channel you know either it's through one hyperscaler one cloud provider cloud provider you know that's the economy which is driving the other uh, service provider other isvs economy on their platform and now here the service provider the system integrator roles role they become so so critical that if the customer goes and you know starts creating these bespoke you know uh, solutions for their digital journey it's never going to work in that way so if we approach uh, the customer's digital journey as a true partner and approach it in an ecosystem model it is a big change in the way traditional partnering with different competencies and trying to align ourselves to a customer journey compared to this now i come on the best practices part right uh, it's pretty much uh, open as well that you know uh, if you have to partner with a large ecosystem partner and the way uh, cloud is now as a hyperscaler they've given the bedrock to the new uh, transformation journey and democratize basically for every customers to think about the new business model more aligned towards their outcome and the it basically serving them as the business right the best practice uh, really comes through you know giving them not the uh, you know variables to fall or you know fail often right best practice is give them the access to the technology in the right way so that it aligns in the right business model and that comes with the investment that we make in the right center of excellence with the uh, right partners more repeatable solutions or integrated uh, you know ips if uh, we have and present it to the customers which basically give uh, them time to not commit immediately and and then think they can't you know uh, kind of reach where the targets are but it's a gradual way they kind of you know use those integrated and outcome based solutions and uh, to enable that uh, partners like us or you know the partners who are looking to create an ecosystem have to really structure the blocks and models in the way that they are able to bring the best of the economy with the hyperscaler is driving to the customer quickly got it interesting that's very interesting but now harish will come to you uh, and to all the panelists i know we are left with very limited time so we want to cover the maximum but harish coming to you now looking at from a different angle the enterprises what are mm-hmm. the next set of expectations that enterprises are expecting when they have to work with three different entities or i would say four different entities the hyperscalers the isvs the sis as well as the advisory firms how as per you can the model become frictionless to deliver an outstanding experience to the customers yeah no it's a great question uh, rajit and this is something uh, that actually i would like to flip uh, and say how can the ecosystem come together to deliver that uh, that seamless experience uh, trees talked about that marian talked about it um, um so so did um, Uh, Michelle, the whole notion is how do you deliver customer outcome um, and not leave the customer with the complexity to, to integrate and manage. Gone are the days of just deploying or integrating, handing over the keys to the customer or monetizing as SLAs. Right? Customers are hit with all of these big cloud trends like regenerative AI, Chat GPT, Five G. They they are looking to see a if this is even real and b uh, can they leverage any part of it uh, or all of it right so they expect different vendors and partners to come together to reduce complexity time to market and increase their chance of success so this will actually require like many of the panelists put together for the ecosystem to come together like never before um you know uh, we talked about co create 
or cell code deliver. Yeah, those are those are fundamental motions that will become more and more prominent in uh in in the in the traditional world. There used to be this uh, notion of partner to partner, but now it's a world of partners to partners. It will be multiple entities coming together. An example is uh, how Microsoft and ServiceNow, um, Microsoft's one of our uh, largest and most important ISV partners, and we are an ISV ourselves. So you, you can actually see two ISVs partnering together with uh, some of our GSI partners like HCL and others to deliver a seamless employee experience. Take an example of me joining ServiceNow a year back. Uh, I had all these questions. So. Typically, in a, in a traditional world, this would have meant me going to different portals or going to different people, but I could just open a simple uh, a chat bot that is built with a Teams, Microsoft Teams front end, and I can fire away questions or fire away requests to get a new PC or, or some device or other things, and magically it all came together. Now, at the back end, this does mean that Microsoft and ServiceNow and our partners have worked together to build all of the and put all of these components together. Uh, so companies like, like us are increasingly realizing that there is a need to differentiate in our offerings in the market. And that means enabling an ecosystem of partners who can build trust, reduce complexity, deliver value, and increase transparency in, 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 in order to achieve traction in the market. So what does this mean for these different constituents? Uh, it means that for hyperscalers, it is you know, availability, scalability, latency, et cetera, stable stakes, right? They are, and they should be focused on providing custom-built clouds, like Marianne talked about, industry clouds, uh, high-performance computing to support AI and uh, machine learning, making hybrid and uh, app mobility easier so that apps can, uh, app can be built for one cloud and that can transient multiple clouds, um, and helping customers make sense of their data, right? Mostly, so, they would need to enable not just the traditional ISVs uh, and professional developers, but today there are citizen developers, right? Like the non-developers who are building applications. Um, now, for, for services partners, it, it, it's about bringing the ability to work with, with multiple tech companies who bring the best of breed platforms together, bring industry expertise, uh, even building IP in some cases with their own customers. And we talked about that in the panel here, um, and then connect all of this through plug and play APIs that is delivered in the cloud, right? It's sure. about automation of managed services to drive efficiency and profitability for themselves. It's also helping customers optimize their cloud spend and driving innovation. For ISVs, um, So how do you very... I'll take that like, as an empowered partner ecosystem? And sorry about the interest of the time. I'll take that yeah, as a the word from your end, the empowered partner ecosystem. And Michel, I'll come yeah. to you. Uh, as per everyone agrees right. that it's moving from a cell as a key motion to the empowered partner ecosystem. What, according to you, are the new benefits that are being added to these empowered motions? Yeah, sorry, was on was on mute. Um, you know, let me let me be brief here and try and uh, share with the audience here maybe a few key takeaways. Um, you know, as the ecosystem shifts away from you know what we would call a traditional transactional. Um, ecosystem and moves more towards mm -hmm. those customer outcomes. I think the entire ecosystem, you know, programmatic approach needs to shift, you know, not necessarily increasing maybe the investments, but shifting where we're making those investments. And some of the things that I've done in previous organizations that I've been with, as well as uh, the organization I'm with now, is looking to really make sure that we're putting the money, you know, into the investments into where the partners are going to, where the activities that we're asking the partner to do, right? So we're really asking them to do more, you know, in the pre-sales validation. We're asking them to do a lot of um, assessments and, and integration and, you know, potentially looking at how a technology might work together uh, with another technology. That was that unification that I talked about earlier. So I think, you know, putting new investments into what I'll call opportunity acceleration funds, um, particularly for the SI who may not even do transactional business, but they, you know, they, they have longer term services, helping them realize that value sooner and making sure that they're getting us, you're paying them on an SOW type basis for services that they're delivering um, during the exploration phase. I think services attach 
um, you know, I think is another way, um, not just them making their own services agreements, but bringing them in and incenting your organization to bring them into opportunities. Because we all know if a, you know, if a deal gets sold and it churns, right, that's the worst thing for, for a customer. Um, and then rewarding on uh, NDE, net dollar expansion and renewal rates. Uh, the only way that companies are going to expand and invest in more technology and buy more from you is because they are adopting that. And so rewarding the partner for playing a role in that customer success is really important. And I know that the industry has shifted away from renewals and has been taking margin away from the ecosystem on renewals. I think if you can have you know, a, an NDE uh, rate or um, a retention rate that is high, you should be increasing you know, that spend out to the partner who's managing those organizations. And then I'll just close with something that um, I'm doing here at, at Security. Many ISVs don't really exist without ISV, other ISVs, right? Um, we are a uh, data security and privacy organization where what we do is we go out and we look for sensitive data, we scan sensitive data, we classify that, and then we enable companies to put controls around that. And we don't really exist if companies don't have their data in other platforms. So in whether that's Workday or whether that's Salesforce, whether that's a hyperscale or whether that's, you know, MongoDB or an on-prem old, you know, Microsoft or, you know, in the cloud or on-prem, we have to be able to work and integrate with the, all of those data platforms in order for us to help our customers unlock that value in a secure and, and way that meets rising obligations and, and privacy regulations. And so we're launching our new unified program that actually rewards partners more and they get greater margins and greater benefits if they enter a pathway with building an integrated solution with security and one of the other ISVs. And so I think those are things for the audience to think about. Sure. So I think so the point of winning together uh, is an important aspect. And Marin, I'll come to you. Uh, I think so you will agree that working, like you being part of the Microsoft, the big organization and working with a GSI, it's, it's a complex uh, ecosystem of the problem to solve. What is the best practice to marry up these two large size organizations, you need each other to succeed, but what are the best practices as per you? If you can quickly cover that, that'll be great. So Drew kind of alerted to it. it it's, it's dedicated business units on both sides, because if you think of it, you got, um, let's say HCL tech, yeah, you have you know 300,000 people working there plus, yeah, you got 200,000 people working at Microsoft. How do you marry it up organizationally? in a sales process, an engineering process, a delivery process. And what we learned is with, with traditional GSIs, they have their practice organizations. They do infra, they do data and AI, they do security. They do that separately. The Microsoft technology stack crosses that all. So when you have then a Microsoft business unit who has that P&L end-to-end, who has that practice, who builds then the office, who knows the Microsoft programs and then rolls that out, whether that is in Canada or it is in Australia or it is in Poland, you have the same kind of consistent operating mechanism, the same kind of PL oversight, you really, really see acceleration. And so we see now that our largest partners have Microsoft business units with almost 70,000 dedicated people only working on Microsoft. We see them growing by far the fastest. And of course, on Microsoft, we have dedicated teams as well to make sure we work with those partners in tandem around the globe. Got it. So this is a dedicated business unit is a, the key mantra to, yeah. to, to, to take the best out of that. Great. For the large uh, Rajat, it's definitely a dedicated mantra because uh, as Marian said, there are hundreds of thousands of you know people across both organizations and the key value proposition that needs to be built together in a large organization in a global system integrator that creation of a value proposition you know uh, stays in different pockets within the company right it could be in a certain practices you know trying to achieve certain value goals for customers but then when we talk about an organization like microsoft you know which plays in all three clouds how do we then you know uh, connect these host pipes together and then, you know, be very precise in taking this value back to the customer. And that's the very critical strategy that we've learned in the last three years with Microsoft is that if you have to expand within our existing customer relationship and we try to get these 
two horses together, right? It really gives a very different perspective on an account and our closeness to the customer's business becomes very, very critical and easy as well. So, so Dhruv, as you're speaking, I'll come to you before I come to trees. Uh, the business models are shifting, like you mentioned, and, and the it has shifted from the time and material, which is used to be at the popular contract model between the customer and GSI, to more the outcome-based model. Are the enterprises looking at the new forms of the model being introduced? And what is the preference by the customers, enterprises? If you can quickly cover that. Dhruv, to you. Okay, I thought this was trees. Okay, so yeah, the, uh, tr traditionally the TA, TNM model have been there, right? Uh, but really the problem, uh, if you see in today's context, is that uh, the skin in the game, right? The really committing to the outcome that the customer wants. And, and then gradually now we you know, let's say moving over to more fixed uh, models, but even even on the fixed price model, right? It, though it gives you more flexibility to add automation, to add you know more innovative ways to you know increase your profitability and the time for the customer execution. But but uh, now if you see that that gradual change is even now more shifted more towards an outcome based model where. We are trying to be closer to what customer expected and their business expected. So as the customer's business is also uh, getting into the IT transformation, the outcome-based model are becoming critical. And as I just mentioned a little while ago, if we have the organization, which is, let's say, uh, HCL and let's say uh, kind of Microsoft, who also not just bring the technologies together, but also enable the economy of other ISVs together, and all this comes together and marries up and then provides that outcome-based model. It is quicker, more committed to the customer. And, you know, I would say the winnability aspect for a system integrator like us, you know, it, it becomes very sticky and winnability also increases. Great. No, but on that aspect, Trees, I will come to you. Uh, and what we are observing, uh, and it will be great to hear your thought, Trees, uh, the current scenario, the enterprises are signing a multi-year contract. So, with, with the supply side. But the reality is they are unable to consume due to the limited understanding on the technology applicability or the industry use cases. How we as part of the ecosystem is aiming to solve this aspect. Yeah, I know. And I know we have just a few more moments and, uh, but to everyone on this panel have really led up to what I'm gonna talk about now and this multi-contract capability especially in a SaaS world, is, is really critical for sustainable uh, business models, sustainable revenue. And there's so much risk, as you stated, because I think that this is one of the biggest risks is going in, signing a contract uh, as a huge enterprise, and then not really understanding that in order for that to be sustainable, uh, you've got to deeply understand not just the use cases of the customer, not just their business needs, but on an ongoing basis, being able to marry up the outcomes that they want to drive and map that back to capabilities in the product. Uh, product's going to continue to evolve. And what happens is we have engineers that are building great capabilities, shoving them out to all of the customers and then the customers are not really focused on the fact uh, that not only the customers are not adopting it, but they're not getting the value. So time to value is one of the key metrics. Um, and this is why the ecosystem is so critical as everyone, you know, Harash, everyone has eloquently stated, the roof and team, that we have to have a dedicated focus for this new multi-dimensional partnership capability. You go in and, and you have your foundational technological capabilities, but you need the industry component. You need the component of continuous uh, success. Uh, I call it coaching training, but continuously allowing the customer to see the value, working with them and envisioning workshops. That's a That might not be what that particular partner does, but you need to connect with someone in a multi-year agreement and look across and think about this as a land and expand motion should never just be three years. It's a decade and beyond. And so you got to go in with the right mindset to say that this is a decade and beyond. And what do we need to do to accelerate time to value for every capability? Why are we you know, making sure that our capabilities are aligned to what the customer not only needs, but what they want to drive 10 years out and have a long term strategic roadmap? So all of those things in a multi-year contract, we've got to think about this highly differently and come together, I think, in unique ways that allows us to look across the landscape of the customer's need, 
look across landscape in a multi-year agreement, and then work our way backwards to make sure that the customer is continuously innovating on their use cases with our technology and capabilities from an industry lens, from a multifunctional lens, and a multidimensional capability lens. I think that's going to be the winner, the winning together that you've been talking about, my friend. Interesting. I think so. That's a great point. More on the innovation around the partnership is an important angle. And to value our uh, uh, attendees' time as well, there's one question and I'll keep it open if anyone can answer. With most ISVs and GSIs partnering with more than one hyperscaler, how can one have partner exclusivity to build differentiation? Anyone can take that. I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Sure. Um, I, I, I think... You know, it depends on your customers, right? You know, if you look at the landscape across the, the hyperscalers, there are different ex areas of expertise, right? Um, you know, Microsoft, you know, has dominated, right, in the in the world of specific applications and um, in, in business software. You know, AWS, you know, has been, you know, extremely dominant in the performance world, you know, for performance storage and, and, um, and consumption. And you look at GCP, who has dominated in the analytics world, right? And so I think, you know, based on the vertical market that you are, um, you know, selling into, whether that is, you know, FinServe, whether that's highly regulated, you know, healthcare or retail, those solutions that you're going to build, maybe you're not exclusive, you know, by hyperscaler because most customers, I mean, we know that 90% are going to be all multi-cloud anyways, because they're looking at different hyperscalers for different value aspects of their business. And so you can approach the hyperscalers in specific solution exclusivity, right? And they're going to fill gaps. You're going to fill gaps with GCP in their product based on your product that maybe you could build an integration with them. You might have, you know, Microsoft might have a gap that they have that they want to work with you to bring higher uh, joint solution and value together to that customer. And so number one, you know, looking at your verticals and looking at um, where your solution best fits for your ideal customer profile, and then working with the hyperscalers on where their strengths are um, or their weaknesses so that you can build a joint solution with them uh, to offer that and not be necessarily um, peanut butter spreading your message in the market across hyperscalers. Interesting, interesting. Anyone else has any other viewpoint on this question? So I think the industry uh, cloud or be pre being precise with, as Michelle said, you know, to not just spread all over and be, be very being very focused on, you know, what uh, our joint strengths are and then which industries we can impact together. Uh, we'll create a very dedicated swim lane on, you know, what we want to capitalize on with each of the large ecosystems and, and what competencies we want to bring together to offer uniquely to our customers as well. So right at my perspective is that um, we always need to think customer centricity. And in order to do customer centricity, there should be no exclusivity because you know the customer needs to have the ability to choice, to choose as they like. And as Nicole, as Michelle also laid out, you know, there are looking at different needs, different, different capabilities. I think where exclusivity comes in, where a company has to have a set of costs, R&D costs, investment costs, and it has to be an ROI. So if, if you looked at some of them, you know, where we talked about actually taking a share ownership in a company, that's obviously when you lock in some exclusivity because you actually have to go through a business model, an economic model that you have. But, you know, even that when you then tie yourself up more exclusively, you want to kind of still have so much flexibility to customers because then you're really going to be successful if, if your customers have that flexibility. Oh, interesting. Harish or uh, Trees, any viewpoint on from you quickly? No, I think I think the other panelists. They said everything. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I think so. This was a very insightful discussion. Uh, I truly value your valuable time for this discussion. And I feel that as a, as a, as a group, we agree that it's a, it's a more focus on the innovation and the simplicity that we need to enable for the partnership. So that's the key learning for me as part of this uh, discussion. But thank you so much for your time. And I'll hand it over to Atul uh, to close it. Yeah, so uh, Rajat, listening to the session, I remember an old uh, partnership quote like, 
alone we can do so little and uh, together we can do so much right so everybody's talked about empoweredness and all things so i think this is truly an insightful session uh thank you to all the speakers and attendees for joining us today thank you great thank you and thank you so much thank you for your valuable time have a great day ahead thank you